but I'm going to tell you what the root cause of all this is. The root cause that can explain all this explains the obesity, the connective tissue disease, the hyperlipidemia, the diabetes, the smoking, the hypertension, the metabolics. The root cause, you've got to get to the root cause problem. We don't. We don't treat your symptoms only. That's wrong. Today, we're going to talk about coronary artery disease in South Asians. Now, this is a talk that not just for South Asians, it's for everybody. Because if you look at the traditional risk factors, there 80% of the risk factors apply to just about everybody. But South Asians, there's something more, there's something funny about them. Mm -hmm. That extra, you know, there's other 20% risk factors which we just can't put our finger on. Why do South Asians have so much coronary artery disease? So let's go right into that. And the prevalence of heart disease in South Asians is extremely high. In non-Asians in the United States, it's 2.5% CAD risk, okay? South Asians, 7.5, three times more. Yet we think that we are protected, that we Indians, we don't have a problem. People from South India don't have a problem. People from Pakistan, Bangladesh, we don't have a problem. Ah, we're fine, you know, we... <laughs> we are three times more at risk than the average person in the United States. And this is not just in the UK, USA, by the way. It's in the UK, South Africa, Trinidad, Fiji, Australia, wherever you go. So there's a problem. What is this problem? So there's a threefold increase in heart disease in South Asians in India also. So if you look at Indians in India, they also have a problem. Right now, we are the number one in the world for coronary artery disease and diabetes and software engineering and a few other things, <laughs> right? right? But we shouldn't be number one in this, right? So if you look at non-diabetics, hmm? non-diabetics in India and abroad, 11% of them have coronary artery disease. Diabetics, 21% of them have severe coronary artery disease. And I'm gonna say this is all wrong because the non-diabetics, 11%, that have coronary artery, they also, they actually have diabetes. They just don't know it. Because our whole methodology in measuring who's got diabetes and who doesn't have diabetes is totally flawed. And today I'm gonna to expose that to you, to tell you that when we go to our regular doctors and everywhere else, they're not telling you the truth. Not because they don't want to, it's because they don't know themselves. There's no difference between pre-diabetes and diabetes. And I'm gonna show you that today. So pre-diabetes, so since we talk about let me just talk about that. Pre-diabetes is when your insulin levels are running so high, but your sugars are still okay. Because it's just taking a whole lot of insulin to keep your sugars under control. Now, the day that your sugar goes out of control, you say, oh, your sugar's are high now, because the insulin can't keep it down. You say, oh, you're a diabetic now. And when the patient becomes a diabetic, then you do the angiograms, the CT scans, and you do the work and say, oh my God, all your arteries are clogged up, and you know, but it didn't happen overnight. You earned it. It took you 20 years to do it, 15 years to do it. That's what made you what you are. It takes 10 to, now this should scare all of you, and I hope that you take this home. It takes 10 to 15 years of prehypertension to develop, I mean pre-diabetes to develop diabetes. That means the process actually starts in your 30s and 40s when the bad lifestyle and the sugar intake and the frequency of eating causes hyperinsulinemia. So you have high insulin. So now when I eat a meal, instead of making this much insulin, I have to have this much insulin. And as the years go by, I make more and more and more insulin. Why am I making more insulin? Because I'm becoming resistant to insulin. Why am I becoming resistant to insulin? Because it's a hormone. So what? Well, a hormone has to be cyclical. How do, how, how do women not ovulate when you give them the birth control pill? Because it's supposed to have periodic variations in the hormonal levels, but when you have a constant level of the hormone, the body doesn't respond to it, so you don't ovulate anymore, right? That's how birth control works. Now we think that we can have constantly elevated insulin levels because we're eating every two, three hours, and we're eating processed foods and refined foods, and then you expect the body to respond with insulin? Well, you'll make insulin, but your body will not respond to it. So what happens as the years go by, you start having to make a gallon of insulin at each meal. 
So then the question really you should be asking me is that then dark, but the sugar is under good control. So what's wrong with that? Well, you missed the boat. All of us missed the boat. The doctors missed the boat. It's not the sugar that's hurting you so much. 20% of the, the bad stuff in your, in your heart and your arteries and your body and your brain and your kidneys is because of the high sugar. But 80% because of the high insulin. So what happens is that it's the hyperinsulinemia that's hurting your arteries, that's paralyzing your arteries, causing calcification of your arteries, causing hardening of your arteries, so that by the time you become a diabetic, it's too late. So why am I hopping on all this? Because most Indians are either pre-diabetic or diabetic, and they just don't know it. Because they feel good. You can't measure your sugar levels, and you can't feel it. You can only measure it. You can't feel my sugar level. Oh, yeah, my sugar is good today. No, you just don't know that. So you have to get it measured. So now it says here that non-diabetic risk is 11% in India because many already are pre-diabetes, hyperinsulin, they just don't know it. They never measured it. So I'm saying to you that this is really one disease, pre-diabetes and diabetes. It's just a question of where you're going to draw the line. So you're going to say, oh, I'm going to call you a diabetic when your sugar levels are now at 100. So what, at 98 I'm not? Do you see the fallacy in its thinking? But this is how medicine has been. And this is the biggest downfall of medicine. That's why we do such a lousy job in prevention. Because we try to just categorize everything. This is a biological human being. is a biological machine. This is not a machine as such. It's biology in action. So you've got to look at it differently. You can't say, oh, a cutoff is at 100. So let me ask you, how did they decide that diabetes is when your random blood sugar is greater than 126? How did they decide that? Why not 127? Why not 125? It's because what they did is said, all these people here have high sugars. So now let's see if you all had high sugars over 100. When shall we call it diabetes? So they went and looked in everyone's eyes, and they found that when they had retinopathy, oh, he's got, he must have diabetes because he's got hardening of the arteries. You can see it in the eye. And those people had a blood sugar greater than 126. So inherent in the diagnosis of diabetes, at 126, you already have the disease. You already have hardening of the arteries. So it's not like you want to know whether you got diabetes or not to find out whether you have hardening of the arteries. No, you already have it at 126. So that's why redefining diabetes is the biggest thing, we have. biggest challenge we have today is diabetes. It is the epidemic in the world. This is the pandemic. This is the real pandemic. Sugar. Sugar is the pandemic. And this is the reason why the entire Indian subcontinent is going to suffer and why America is going to suffer too. This is the reason why healthcare is going to be non-sustainable. It's because of, of pre-diabetes and diabetes. Right now, if you look at the definition of metabolic syndrome, which is pre-diabetes, by that definition, more than 80% of the U.S. population has either diabetes or pre-diabetes. 80%. They just don't know it. So let's go over some of these things. Let's come back to the Indians since that's what we're talking about today. Indians in the US have the same rate of coronary arteries as Indians in India, Singapore, Mauritius, Fiji, Trinidad, name it. And then in the United States, compared to the Caucasian population, we have four times more hospitalization, four times more complications, and five to 10 times more disease in those under the age of 40. Now, what does that mean? That means there's a malignant disease in Indians and South Asians. So whereas a Caucasian can get diabetes, he'll manifest his disease in his 60s, in his 70s maybe, right? Caucasians under 40, they already have it. Does it mean they're a weaker race? It's something. It's something about the same risk factor presenting much earlier and in younger people and the mortality is much higher in Indians and South Asians when they have coronary artery disease than in Caucasians. And there is a reason for all this. It's because you, you, because you are all cactuses living in rainforests. What does that mean? What does that mean? That, what I'm trying to tell you, is that you've come out of your environment and you're living in a totally different environment. That's why you are far more prone to this disease than Caucasians. 
because teleologically and from the evolutionary standpoint, this is not something you're supposed to be. You're not supposed to be eating every two hours. You're not supposed to be eating all the sugary things. You're not supposed to be eating all the processed foods. Mm -hmm. So if you look at history of the human being, Homo sapien, right? There have been 200,000 generations before the agricultural revolution. Then, how many generations went by in the agricultural revolution? Anybody has an idea? It's only 600 generations. Only 600 generations in the agricultural revolution. And how many generations have gone by with the industrial revolution? 10. So when you look at the span of time and the genetics, your genetics, your genetics that you all have here right now, you want to say, oh, yeah, agricultural is going to change my genetics, you know, my agricultural stuff, you know. It's only been 600 generations. So that's only in the last four minutes of the history of the Homo sapien. And the Industrial Revolution represents one millisecond, one millisecond of your entire ancestral history. So how do you expect your genetics to have evolved? So I say to all of you, continue doing what you're doing right now. And another 100,000 generations from now, your progeny will develop the genetic changes that are going to be necessary to sustain this type of lifestyle. And they'll live to 110 years old as well. And they'll be healthy. What kind of nonsense is that? So you want to eat plastics? And you want to eat artificial and processed foods? Fine, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Another 100,000 generations from now, those kids will be able to handle this diet that we're doing today. You see the lag phase? That's why you're a cactus in a rainforest. Because your genetics have not evolved concurrently with your environment. You're total misplaced. And I'm not talking about just you, I'm talking about everybody in the United States. Everybody, all human beings on this planet. We are misplaced in time. And we've so rapidly changed our environment and our food and our lifestyle and processing and everything else. And then we expect our genetics to handle it. You know, I'm a diesel engine and you're trying to put gasoline in me. That's the problem. Then you're wondering why I sputter and make no noises, huh? That's why it happens. So coronary artery disease is definitely more malignant in cell. It's because genetically you haven't evolved on that background. So the risk factors are metabolic syndrome, as you know, hypertension, smoking. But look, diabetes. Now, diabetes and prediabetes causes hypertension. So I'm going to stop here right now and say that hypertension. You all know what high blood pressure is, right? Oh, yeah, I got high blood pressure. There's no such thing as high blood pressure on its own. There's no such thing. It's always a reason for high blood pressure. It's either you have sleep apnea because you're overweight, or you have diabetes or prediabetes. Or you have a kidney problem. There's always a reason for hypertension. And if your doctor says to you, oh, you just got hypertension. Well, then what? God just wanted to give you hypertension? Oh, I just need, I had hypertension deficiency. Yeah, there's no such thing. So there's always a reason for hypertension. Don't let anyone tell you that, oh, yeah, you just have idiopathic hypertension or essential hypertension. There's no such thing. And then hyperlipidemia. And then connective tissue disease and obesity. Now, all these things are understandable. But I'm going to tell you what the root cause of all this is. The root cause that can explain all this explains the obesity, the connective tissue disease, the hyperlipidemia, the diabetes, the smoking, the hypertension, the metabolic syndrome. The root cause, you've got to get to the root cause problem. We don't. We don't treat your symptoms only. That's wrong, right? So Asians have fewer traditional risk factors, but the threshold, which I already mentioned, is, is much worse for South Asians. So your body mass index, your weight, if a Caucasian has a body mass more than 25, then he'll start running into problems. He's getting overweight now. South Asians, 23. 23! Your, bo your, your, your body mass index needs to be less than 23. Your blood pressure needs to be less than 130 over 85. A Caucasian can handle 140 over 90. You can't. You need to know this. So when you go to a doctor, it's not one treatment for all, which is what we tend to do. South Asian walks into my office, a black guy walks in there, a Hispanic walks in there, a Caucasian walks in there, everyone will treat them all the same way. You can't do that. You see, so if a Chinese guy has high blood pressure, 
he's going to get a stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke, at the same blood pressure that the Caucasian will have nothing wrong. And at that same blood pressure, the poor black guys, they get kidney failure. Go to the dialysis center, you'll see it. So these are ethnic genetics that cause different phenotypes with the same degree of disease. Something going on here because we are all made different. Your genetic background is totally different than the genetic background of Caucasians or Latinos or blacks. They all have their problem. So when a black guy comes into my office, I'm really worried about his blood pressure and the first test I'm gonna order is a kidney test because his creatinine is already elevating at 140 over 90. The Chinese guy that walks in and if he says, I got this intense headache here, he's got a stroke, he's got a hemorrhage. So you've got to know some of these things. Anyway, let's keep going on. So the next one I said here is increased abdominal hip ratio greater than 0.85. So this is very important because the shape of man has changed. The shape of man doesn't look like David the statue anymore. <laughs> the new man looks like this. And he's got his Coke in the one hand and he's got a hamburger in the other. What's going on? The shape of man has changed. And why has it changed? I'm going to tell you that this is not just from eating too much. This is from hormonal change. You've become a hormonally modified human being. I started out by talking about hormones. Which hormone? Insulin. So now you understand that it's not about calories in and calories out. You can have the same amount of calories, but if they're causing a problem with insulin, then you're going to become a hormonally modified human being and you're going to get all the diseases associated with, this, with hyperinsulinemia. So it's n this old theory about calories in and calories out, totally wrong. So those studies have already been done in rats. They've been done in human beings already. 2,000 calories, both groups. But this group is processed foods. They all get sick. Same group, 2,000 calories, but whole foods. They do just fine. Because I just told you that for so many generations you are consuming whole foods, now you're eating processed foods. Your gut didn't change. It's still 13 feet of bowels. Your hormones didn't change. But now all that processed food, all that lot, all that flour, all the refined products suddenly hit your duodenum. The K cells go crazy. They've never seen this before. They've never seen so much powdery stuff come through the stomach and say, oh my God, what are we going to do with all this? I'm supposed to be slowly digesting this over 13 feet of bowels. Instead, I have to now deal with all this in one onslaught. So what do I do? I produce a whole lot of GIP, which is a hormone. And that causes the pancreas, goes to the pancreas and says, make all the insulin you can, man. I have a whole truckload of food here. That's exactly what your body's language is saying. So the insulin comes along, pumps into your bloodstream, and says, yeah, I'm going to get rid of all that sugar. That's gone. And what does it do? It puts it all into storage. Insulin's job is to put it into storage. And when insulin puts it into storage, where does it put it? It puts it into four places. You all need to know what insulin does, because glucose is bad in the bloodstream. It has to get it out. The first place it puts it into your liver. So you get a fatty liver. 80% of Indians have a fatty liver. 80%. The next place it puts it is next to the pancreas. So you get a fatty pancreas and a fat in the gut, and then the viscera, the viscera. So you look at him from the back, he looks great. Turn sideways, oh my God! <laughs> That's the guy. That's the guy. So it all goes into the viscera. And then the fourth place it goes to is to the muscles. And when it gets to the muscles, then it's in between all the muscle cells and it causes insulin resistance, even more insulin resistance, because now those muscles can't respond uh, properly to the, to the signals from insulin. So if you look around, you can see it. It's in front of your eyes, everywhere. So this is what's happening with insulin. So you're becoming a hormonally modified human being. So only 2,000 calories you took in, just like the other guy. But you took it in the form of processed foods, in the form of powdered stuff, lot, flour, Croissants, bagels, cake, chips, all the processed things that you like. To. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Anything that's made in a box, comes in a box. Anything that comes in a box, don't eat it. 
Anything that's made in a factory, don't eat it. Anything that comes with a barcode, don't eat it. <laughs> Anything that's got a label on it and says ingredients have all these things. You know, is there a label on a banana? No. <laughs> eat it. <laughs> but if it's got a box and it's got a, a little label on it with nutritional, this, you know why they do that? Why, why do they put that? Because they want to fool you into thinking you can buy that stuff. Half of you, no, not even half. 90% of you don't know how to read that label. No, nobody knows how to read that label here. If I ask you how many grams of, 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 of um, okay, okay. In a teaspoon of sugar, how many grams of glucose is in it? Or sugar? One gram. You can't Google, you can't call your best friend. <laughs> It's four, right? Four grams. So the packet says, and this, this, this is real, okay? This is real. So a packet says, or the can says, 24 grams of sugar in it. Divide that by four, that's eight. Would you, in your right sense of mind, have eight teaspoons of true sugar? Right now. Come on. Now, I started this talk. By the end of this talk, you should have finished the can, right? Eight teaspoons of sugar. Would you do it? But you've been bamboozled. You've been bamboozled by the industry, by the food industry, because they want your money, okay? Just put your money out there, go buy that food. So you'll have these beautiful advertisements, the colorings, and they'll show, oh yeah, you know, yeah, have this drink, and they show this happy family killing themselves. But you think, oh, they're having a great time. And then you think that in the mornings, oh yeah, this is great, I got my orange juice, I'm, I'm, I'm a kid, I love you, my child, I love you. Here, yeah, have some orange juice. And then you give them some Pop-Tarts at the same time. Say, so, yeah, this is good breakfast for you, you know. So have some Pop-Tarts here. Yeah? And better still, you have some cereal. I took it out of this Kellogg's box. Cereal. And you're going to give the kids some cereal and top it up with some skim milk in it, which is also a product. Now, that kid is going to develop pre-diabetes, obesity, hormonal modifications, athos. Look, look, the sad thing is we know this, and I have all the data for this. But who's listening? Only you will listen. Because let me tell you, government authorities are not listening. The Department of Agriculture is not going to listen. There's too many financial things behind all this. You cannot change anything. There's too many food subsidies for all those people that do all the bad things. There's no way you can do it. But you as the consumer can change it. You as the consumer can change this. So anything that goes in a box, anything, just don't eat it. So <laughs> urban. Urbans, Indians in, in urban area versus rural areas, okay? How come in India they, they weigh more in the cities? Because now I'm civilized. <laughs> I'm a city man. And I eat like a city man now. Three times a week I go out. And I eat out. And I have to poison myself. Come on. This is why the city guys are dying and the urban people are not. Look at their waste ratios. Hmm? They're off. They're sedentary, non-sedentary, right? Abdominal obesity, pre-diabetes. This is well documented, the difference between cities and the gowns, the gowns being the villages. All right, so let's keep talking more here. Pre-diabetes, the prevalence of diabetes in U.S. 5.3. India, 12 to 14%. Because India has changed the way it eats. Everything is now refined. Everything is made out of flour. Everything is ready-made. And you can eat all this busu. What you call busu? What you call it? Uh, chevra and, and gantias and <laughs> all these things that you, you, you find and say, oh, yeah, this is great stuff. I'm inviting my best friend. I love you, my friend. Yeah, eat this. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're doing. Yeah? And then if you look at these people, they have high blood pressure, they have high triglyceride, they have low HDL. So when I look at that, I already know that they have hyperinsulinemia. So... 50% of South Asians are vegetarians. Wait a second. Then why do they have such a high incidence of Oh, yeah, it's the meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, meat, red meat. That's another lie that you've all been taught. Red meat causes coronary Then explain to me, sir, why if 50% of the population, in fact, in some places it's even more in India, it's 80% in certain areas of India, are vegetarians, how come they have such a high incidence of coronary artery disease? It's not nothing to do with red meat and chicken. It's nothing to do with that. It's to do with sugar. What's the biggest poison in the world? Sugar. Sugar. sugar uh, uh, so this is all lies. 
Red meat, red meat. No, you got, I don't mind red meat, but you've got to eat grass-finished red meat. So it contains all the vitamin K2 and none of the omega-6s in it. You see, now the, the meat you buy today is manufactured because they're eating corn. Well, since when are cows supposed to eat corn? And then you give them antibiotics because the corn rots in the stomach. They have four stomachs. They're supposed to re, you know, be ruminants, right? But they can't because they're corn. It starts rotting, and then they die. So you have to give them antibiotics to kill all the bad bacteria in their gut. And then those bacteria, uh, then all those antibodies get into your bloodstream, and then you get dysbiosis. And then you wonder why you all have dysbiosis, and why you got so many antibiotics going on in your colon, killing those poor bacteria in your gut, which should be actually helping you. Do you see the vicious cycle here? So I don't mind me, and all my studies clearly show that. But make sure it's grass finished, natural, without that omega six corn oil. Oh no, but we got fields and fields of corn for this purpose. 80% of the corn is fed to animals, not even humans. But it gets to you through the fat. And it's all omega-6. That brings me to oil, because since we are going to be limited in time, let me just jump right into it. What did Indians do? What did they all do? They all started eating vegetable oils. Because Ansel Keys came out in 1957 and said, oh, yeah, animal fat is bad for you, you know. So all butter went out through the door, ghee went out through the door, and we went to vegetable seed oils. And hence, we have this epidemic also of coronary artery disease. So I told you about sugar being the bad boy. What's the second worst bad boy? Vegetable seed oils. So why do they call it vegetable seed oils? Because they bamboozled you again. There's no oil in vegetables, but they call it vegetable seed because it sounds so healthy. You know, it's vegetable seed. Oil. So, it's so nice. It's so benign. You know, it's so good. It's good for you. Vegetable seed oil. My teacher said something about vegetables, right? So I'll have that oil. It's craziness going on. So the vegetables here. So they went to Vanaspati ghee. That's vegetable ghee in India. So basically, they called it ghee, but they called it vanaspati ghee. So this is vegetable seed oils. It contains a whole lot of omega-6 in it and omega-9, which is very pro-inflammatory. If you saw how they make that oil, you won't touch it. If you saw how they make it in that factory, I tell you, you know, all the solvents they use, all the chemicals they use, the colorings, the deodorizing and everything else, and now it looks nice and you know, golden red, so nice, you know, golden color. Yeah, sunflower seed oil, safflower oil, canola oil, corn oil, soy oil. And you go to the restaurants and they cook everything in that oil and it's, you, know, you think it's just fine. They must have used the best quality oil, you know. Yeah. They just poisoned your food for you. <laughs> Sweet poison. No vegetable seed oils. Vegetable seed oils will kill you. They cause, they cause lots of problems with the body. So what they cause is oxidation because they're polyunsaturated. Polyunsaturated means they have bonds, hydrogen bonds that are unsaturated. So what happens that there are other molecules that can stick to it. Saturated fats, there's nothing they can interact with. You take a piece of ghee and you leave it here, nothing's going to happen to it. It will not go rancid. For months and months, it won't go rancid. But if you take vegetable seed oils, it will get rancid within a matter of a day or two. And in order for it not to go there, they put preservatives in it. No vegetable. You want to you put some oil? You put a piece of butter in there. Or better still, it's pure ghee. That's the thing you got to use. So I have a whole lecture on YouTube called The Fat Lies. And it talks about the chemical structures of oils and ghee and, and does a full, ex and then all the studies that have been done showing that people who eat saturated fats, they don't get coronary artery disease. Those who eat polyunsaturated fats get coronary artery disease and cancer. Because it's so proven. In fact, I remember when I was a fellow, we used to read all these uh, uh, studies that they were doing at Yale University, and you want to grow cancer cells, you put vegetable oil in it. You want rats to get cancer, you give them vegetable oils. So you feed them vegetable oils, and the poor rats get cancer. Oh, but you know, we do it here ourselves. So you know how Cisco came out, right? Crisco, you know what Crisco is? Yeah, yeah Crisco is cottonseed oil, right? So it came out because at the turn of the century when the Ford industry was taken off with the cars, they used to have all these cotton seeds left over, so they used to get the oil from it. It was black and horrible. And they used to put that cotton seed in the cars, you know, to oil them and lubricate them. 
But even then, there was so much left over because the cotton industry was so big. So they said, what are we going to do with all this stuff? So one smart scientist said, I can think of something. And he took it and he put it through a whole bunch of chemicals and he made it into this white, solid stuff. And he tasted it. He said, man, this thing tastes good. I think we should feed it to people. <laughs> he sold the, 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 the formula to Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble, Gamble took it, put it in a tin and called it Crisco. And they said, now how are we going to get people to use this? Well, you see, it's got a long shelf, shelf life. Crisco does. So they took it and they made a book, a cooking book. And they gave it out for free to everybody. This is how you bake with Crisco. So right until 1965, 66, we used to bake with Crisco only. And we saw the incident of coronary artery disease shooting up. But this is what happened in India as well. So my point in India is that we moved away from ghee because we were very intelligent and we were listening to what the Western scientists were doing here. Because in 1977, the McGovern government uh, the, came out and said that it's, it's all to do with uh, saturated fats, and we believed it. And it's got nothing to do with it. So they blamed saturated fats, vegetarians and non-vegetarians. Everyone started consuming vegetable seeds. So we moved away from coconut oil. We moved away from, from ghee, and we started consuming vegetable seed oils. And this is what caused a whole new problem for us. So look at the global consumption of vegetable oils. Massive. We've never consumed so much vegetable oil <laughs> in our life. Peanut oil, cottonseed oil, sunflower, corn oil, canola oil, soybean oil, palm oil. So you say, oh, yeah, I come home and I like to eat some nuts. So I noticed, I only just noticed it not so many years ago, that so beautiful walnuts, pecans, and all these things. But when I lit at the bottom, roasted in sunflower seed oil. I stopped it. So now I buy the raw nuts. And I'd rather just eat the raw nuts without all that oil in it. Because they're just ruining it. Now my nuts have a lot of good oil in it. Nuts are very healthy. They have good oil in it. But not when they are roasted in all that junk. So be careful what you do. And read those little... It, did it have a label? Yeah. The, 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 the box of the, the can of uh, nuts, mixed nuts, has a label on it. Well, I should have already known. <laughs> <laughs> so, risk factors. So also in India, what happened is that vegetarian and non-vegetarian, we started consuming too much carbs, way too much carbs, and they're all processed carbs. So look what I'm going to say, wheat flour. Wheat flour is not something we should all be consuming. Your great-grandfathers used to have millet and sorghum, not wheat. Remember, wheat came in the last one millisecond in your evolution. How can this body handle wheat when it only came in the last one millisecond of your entire ancestral teleological history as a homo sapien? Doesn't make sense. And then chick, chickpea flour. Oh yeah, this is healthy. Chick, chick, what do I say? Chickpea flour. Vegetable seed oil. Then sugars and sweets. So as we went to the cities, oh, I got a job now. You know, I'm a software engineer now. I deserve to eat more sweets and sugars. And every time my friends come, go to the wedding and all this, it doesn't matter. I still bring the mitai home and I eat every day a piece of sweet. And I love this stuff. My best friends come, I give them some sweets. And someone's daughter's getting married, it's sweet. Someone dies, I give them a lot of us as well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Please join me. Yeah. <laughs> Any occasion, here it is, go for it. I mean, this is what we did. But why? Because I can afford it now. Just think about it. Standard of living has gone up. I can afford it now. So I can afford some nice poison now. <laughs> I can afford the poison. This is exactly what's happening. But if you live to and eat like a poor man, and eat the way your, not grandfather, but your great-grandfather ate, or great-grandmother ate. You will live long, of course, but you will live healthy. You see, it's not lifespan, it's the health span. Look at Indians. They want to live into the 90s, but after 70, they get dementia, they get coronary artery disease, they get peripheral vascular disease, they get bad eyes, the joints are all gone. The common thing is inflammation. So you, you think all these joint problems are, are just all old age, you know? Well, you never worked your joints that hard. It's not that. It's because you have inflammation in your body. That's why your hips are giving out and your knees are giving out and your shoulders are giving out. It's inflammation. We know that now. So, this is your, so if you look at inflammation in the body, inflammation, what is inflammation? It's inflamed against something that's foreign to it. What's foreign to it? 
to this body. Everything you're putting inside it is formed. Your biggest problem is your stomach, your gut, because that is where the border is. That is the difference between you and the outside world. It's not the skin and what's outside it. It's between that you're a hollow tube. There's a tube that goes all the way through. Everything that's in that tube is the difference when your gut has to decide what's coming in, what's going out, what's friends, what's not friends. When it's breached, am I going to act against this? Am I not going to act against this? And that's what causes inflammation. You get it now? What causes inflammation? So what's causing inflammation is what you're putting down your tube. That's what's causing the inflammation. So, but people, Asians in the U.S., they also eat U.S. food, which is called the standard American diet. In other words, sad, sad diet. <laughs> Pretty sad, isn't it? Yeah. So we're getting an added dose effect because now we're going to eat all that chevra and everything else, and we're going to do all that, but then we've got to have pizza twice a week. <laughs> hamburgers and you get some french fries throw in the french fry you know i'm really running late i'm just going to run in and get some french fries as well yeah but i can tell you that the french fries that they used to make with lard was actually much healthier for you than the french fries you eat today with vegetable seed oils because the vegetable seed oils will produce trans fats so i haven't mentioned anything about trans fats so trans fats are the worst type of fats they're not made from ghee and saturated fats trans fats are made from polyunsaturated fats so when you reheat vegetable oils, you create trans fats. So when you cook with vegetable oil, and you did your vagara and everything in it, then you reheat it again in the micro, it's beautiful. You've got all those trans fats now. <laughs> you don't even know it. Did you know that you're creating trans fats in your own microwave machine if you've made your food in vegetable oils? So you want to stay away from vegetable oils. So to reduce the risk, this is important. Now, what is also important in all of us is that we need to identify whether you already have the disease or not. So for Indians, I tell them, look, instead of guessing whether you got disease or not, well, you know, my cholesterol, my blood pressure, my family history, yeah, that might give you an indication as, are you going to rely on that as an algorithm to tell you whether you actually have the disease or not? No. You should do a coronary calcium score. Because that will tell you whether you actually got the disease, yes or no. There's no guessing about it. Yes, I got, got coronary calcium. Oh, this is a coronary calcium scan. Okay, so this is the scan that I showed you, the big machine. The big white stuff that you see where the arrows are, that's the calcium in the walls of that. That means you already have the disease. You already have it. Who's doing this? Nobody's doing this. Now, oh, but I get my stress test. Oh, yeah, I do a stress test. Well, how, what good is that? A stress test is only going to show up positive when you have a blockage more than 70%. So the Baya, you come and I do a stress test on you, you pass. Does that mean you're all right? No. Because that just means you have a blockage maybe, but it's 50, maybe it's 60, maybe it's 70% blocked. So I say to you, oh yeah, you're fine, you pass your stress test. You may have a 50, 60% blockage, but no problem, keep going. <laughs> Are you going to be happy? That's why I do coronary calcium scores. Because then I can say to you, you don't have a positive stress test. There's no sign of any lack of circulation because you have a less than 70% blockage. But your calcium score is positive. So you better follow my program or else. Because what's going to happen is that calcium is going to break and you can get a heart attack. Because that's what a heart attack is. When the calcium breaks inside the artery and a blood clot forms on it. So all South Asians should be doing this calcium score. And it costs only 99 bucks. This is a CT angiogram. CT angiogram is when you inject the dye and then you do the scan of the heart. And you can see the heart. And you can see the arteries. And you can see how badly that artery is clogged up. It's got all those white areas where the calcium is. And then look at the rest of the artery. They're not nice and big and juicy, straightforward. No, this is, this is a very badly diseased artery. Just look at it. No guessing. Now, when you see that, you make them change their lifestyle, you make them lose weight, get down to 23, change your food, and do fasting. Come to fasting and say, these are more pictures of the arteries and what they should not look like, right? All of these arteries. So when I see these in a, in a patient, then I say, okay, let's do a stress test to see if these are causing any limitation in your blood flow. And that's how we handle it. And then I open them up if I need to, if I need to. 
Here's more pictures of the same arteries. This is what it looks like. See, this is what I, I study all day long. This is what I'm looking at people's hearts. And that's how I decide what's going on. Then how do you detect the high insulin level? You drink the sugar water, and then you measure the insulin levels after sugar water. You measure your sugar as well. Make sure that you're not a frank diabetic, but you must measure your insulin levels as well. That's the, I showed you the machine in the, in the blood lab. Your CRP is a test for inflammation. Homocysteine is another test that can tell you how much inflammation is in your body. Your A1C tells you about sugar. And then the ratio of the triglycerides to HDL is very important because that is the cholesterol issue that tells you what's going on in your body, not your LDL levels. That's another lie that I have to tell you about. It's got nothing to do with LDL. It's got to do with triglyceride and HDL. That's the number one predictor for coronary artery disease and vascular disease. And that is dependent on your sugar status and your insulin status. So LDL goes up and it gets oxidized. Yes, it does. But that's not the cause. It's the inflammation that makes you have small, dense LDL. Now you're saying that that causal relationship, that that's a causal? No, it's an association. It's like that kid who's eating, um, uh, who's eating ice cream all the time, and then one kid drowns. Then you blame the ice cream. Yeah, it must be ice cream. Because most of the kids who drown have just been eating ice cream right before they did drown, right? So you blame the ice cream. It's the same thing here with the LDL. So we have learned so much about this. So what I like to do is do a liver ultrasound in South Asians. If you have fat in your liver, you already have the disease. You better change your diet. Fat shouldn't be in the liver. You shouldn't have a fatty liver. So why fast? Why, why, why do you want to fast? Because your insulin levels will come down with fasting. If you don't eat, what happens to your insulin levels? They go down because insulin is only brought on by eating. That's why I make you fast. That's why if you're a patient at CVI, you have to eat only once a day or twice a day. If you're gonna eat twice a day, you start out with that eating, but you must eat in a six hour window. And then no eating the rest of the 18 hours. If you're constantly eating, you're making too much insulin. So you wanna fast so that your insulin levels come down. So then after fasting for 18 or 24 hours, when you then do eat, you're sensitive to insulin. So your pancreas will only make this much insulin with the next meal versus a whole gallon before. So eating in a fasting state produces small insulin than eating in a fed state, where you produce a lot of insulin. We are always eating in a fed state. Why are you eating if you're just fed? Let me ask you, why are you eating? You just had a meal two, eat, two hours ago. Why do you have to eat again? <laughs> are you hungry? Are you hungry? You're not hungry? Oh, no, but I have to eat. Why? <laughs> because, two things. One, you're a junkie, you're an addict. You're an addict. Just like cocaine, just like heroin, you're an addict. Because that sugar goes to the same part of the brain as dopamine. So it gives you that reward center. So now, you have to have your next high. This is very real, guys. That's why intermittent fasting breaks that habit. How do you make a junkie come off his cocaine? You stick him in a room and don't give him any heroin. That's it, or cocaine. So you gotta do the same thing. You gotta play around with your physiology. You gotta play around with it so you don't become an addict. Otherwise, it says, I gotta eat now. You're not hungry, but you still have to eat. You're a junkie. So that's the biggest problem, why we eat so frequently. Number two is we've been socially indoctrinated to eat. It's time to eat. <laughs> so I don't have an urge or anything, yeah, and if I don't eat, I'm not gonna get cravings that I gotta go eat, I gotta go eat, go eat. No, but it's just, it's one o'clock, so I gotta go eat. <laughs> now I'm saying, why do you have to do that? Who said you gotta eat three meals a day and two snacks? The food industry said that. You didn't say it, your doctor didn't say it. So I want you all to now have conscious feeding. Conscious feeding. That means you eat when you're hungry. If you're not hungry, don't eat. You're not going to die. So if I stop eating today, how much energy do I have left in my body that will sustain me? Anyone got any ideas? 42 days minimum. 
42 days. I had a patient that came from Fort Lauderdale. He weighed 395 pounds. I made him fast for 108 days. After 108 days, he weighed 195 pounds. He looked like a million bucks. His electrolytes were all completely normal. He looked fantastic. He only drank water. His diabetes was gone. His hypertension is gone. I had another patient that came from West Palm Beach. He lost 70 pounds, eat, drinking only water. That's it. He lost 70 pounds. His sugar is gone. Diabetes is gone. High blood pressure gone. Joint pains all gone. He looks like a million bucks. So I'm not saying that all of you should go out and do a 100-day fast or something. But I'm just saying that if they didn't die, I don't think you'll die if you don't eat for a day. I don't think you'll die if you don't eat for two days. You won't. In fact, you'll feel better. I had a patient that came this week to my office. The guy came from up north somewhere. I can't remember exactly. I think it was Jacksonville. So this guy, he already did. He watched my videos, and he did a seven-day fast. And he lost 18 pounds in seven days. 18 pounds. He looks fantastic. He says, my, I've never felt better in my life. And he, and he said the third day was a little hard. But after the third day, he felt so good. He felt ex amazing energy. Because, you see, what it also does, it detoxes you. Fasting detoxifies you because you've got all these heavy metals in you and toxins. Fasting is the only thing that gets rid of toxins. Number two, it gives your gut a break so that the bacteria in your gut can reset. Because if you're constantly eating those poor bacteria, and remember, more than 50% of the nutrients that are floating inside your bloodstream are not what you ate. It's what your bacteria have made, metabolized, and released into your bloodstream. So you need the right bacteria in your gut. All of us in this room have messed up your gut bacteria. And those are your friends. You have 10 trillion cells in your body. You have 100 trillion bacterial cells in your body. You are more bacteria than you are human. Think about that for a moment. It's a symbiotic relationship between the bacteria and you. Otherwise, why did God put bacteria in our gut? For what? Oh, yeah, I'm just going to give humans some bacteria. Boom. Just think about it. Why would you have bacteria in your gut? And so much, so many. So you think that a lot of these drugs work because, oh yeah, doc gave me this drug and, and it goes into my system and I absorb it and it's doing... No. At least 20% of the drugs are actually metabolized by your bacteria in your gut. And their metabolites get released into your bloodstream. So therefore, if you wiped out all your bacteria, so if we did the study in mice, we do it all the time take out all the bacteria, then we give them the drug, no effect. You put the bacteria back again, now you have an effect. In fact, we do even better things. We take the, the stools from a fat person and transplant it into a thin person. And the thin person gets fat. We do the opposite. We take the fat guy, Take out all his bacteria, give him three courses of antibiotics, knock it out, and then take the stools of a thin, healthy college student and stick it inside him, and he loses weight. How do you figure all this out? See, by the way, if you want to do that last thing that I said, you've got to go to California. They do it. <laughs> In California, if you're a high school student, I mean a college student, and if you can show that you're healthy, you give them a stool sample, they look at the variety of bacteria in it, they say, yeah, are you healthy? Every morning you take a dump with them, and you get your dollars. What a great life. What a great, for college students, they got it made. They can donate all sorts of parts of their bodies. <laughs> Nothing goes to waste. <laughs> Nothing goes to waste, you know? But the point is, the point is that what I'm trying to tell you all is that what you eat has huge repercussions on your hormones, your bacteria. Every, every time you eat, you've got to consciously eat. Think twice before you put anything down your stomach. What you're going to eat? You should be eating fermented foods. You should be eating bacterial products. Like you should be eating lots of yogurt and dye and, and all, you know, uh, sauerkraut if you, if you live here, you know, which is cauliflower and cabbage that has been fermented and kefir, and, 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 and balsamic vinegar. And these, these are extremely healthy for your gut. So eat only whole foods, please. Don't eat any processed foods. Eat high fiber intake from a variety of plants. A lot of fiber. Fiber, 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 fiber. 
Because the fiber, what for who? It's not for you. You can't digest fiber. Fiber goes to your bacteria. I just told you how important bacteria are. Why are you starving them? So your poor bacteria, they're waiting for their food. They only live on one thing that they love, which is fiber, which is a polysaccharide. But instead, you're giving them sugar. Now, there are bacteria that live on sugar, but those are the bad boys. They produce metabolites that are no good. So you just invited the, 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 the worst um, teams to come and play in your backyard. The bad guys. Why are you inviting the bad guys into your gut? So kefir, sauerkraut, kimchi, yogurt, to improve the biodiversity of your microbiome. And non-processed foods must be whole foods. Must be whole. Must be whole. And measure your blood pressures. And get your weight down to BMI of 23. And you must do intermittent fasting so you can restore insulin sensitivity, which I talked to you about, and to improve your microbiota and to improve your leaky gut. What is that all about? Now I'm going to tell you about inflammation a little bit more. So if you have a leaky gut, the food creates an antibody response. Therefore, you get joint pains, mental fog. Who don't you know that has mental fog? Who don't you know that's got early dementia already? Where do you think that's coming from? It comes from inflammation from a leaky gut. So if you fix the gut, all of a sudden that person's brain starts working better because all that inflammatory stuff crosses the blood-brain barrier causes what is known as mental fog. And this happens not only to old people. I do this to a lot of young people. They come and say, oh my God, doc, I'm just, every morning I wake up, I got this fog. My brain is a fog. And then I make them change their diet. And the first thing they come back and say, you know, I feel so much alive. I can think better. My memory is better. So you got to fast. You got to do time-restricted feeding. OMAD. OMAD means eating one meal a day. Because your ancestors and you are not such great hunters that you can make a kill every two hours. <laughs> and stop eating at night because you can't bring the carcass into your cave because then the hyenas will come into your cave as well and eat you up. <laughs> <laughs> so you're supposed to only eat one meal a day and get it over with. Okay. And addiction. Consciously think about it because you are becoming addicted to wheat, sweetness, sugar, caffeine, dairy products and snacks. They actually cause addiction. You think you're not addicted? I can prove to all of you, you are in some way or the other addicted. So these patients come and say, oh, I felt so bad. By 4 o'clock, I was hangry. So I said, OK, so what did you do? He says, I ate. Then I felt good. So I said, why do you think you're feeling bad? My sugar went so low. So I said, did you measure your sugar? Yeah, it was 90. So I said, that's not low. <laughs> so they're feeling bad. It's not just low sugar. You're feeling bad because you're a junkie. You're a junkie. So exercise daily. And I prefer resistance exercise. What does that mean, resistance exercise? That means resistance against flow. I love flow exercises. Resist not just running, running, running for four miles a day or five miles, because you were not made to run. Because if you tried to run away from the saber-toothed tiger, he'll have caught you by then and eaten you up. <laughs> you can't outrun a saber-toothed tiger. So teleologically, you, but you are made to sprint quickly behind a rock, quickly climb up a tree, quickly swim across a little stream, quickly run and hide, move quickly. That's what you're supposed to do. But all this, oh yeah, I get up in the morning, five miles, I run, run, run. That's nonsense. So all these marathon runners come to my office over here, and they're 62, and they look like they're 82. <laughs> Have you noticed that marathon runners, their skin is all hanging, and they've got creases everywhere? So what are you doing to yourself? But the sprinters, they do great. They don't have joint problems, because you're producing antioxidants all the time in your body. But your ability is restricted by the amount that you're producing all the time. So there's an imbalance. So you hurt your knees, you cause blood pressure, you burn out your organs. It's terrible. Running is okay if you just want a little bit of cardio, but just a little bit of cardio. You should do interval training, fast, slow, fast, slow. Recover, exercise, recover, exercise. Push, relax, push, relax. That's the kind of stuff. So it's, it's interval training. You can talk to your, your trainers about it. But if he tells you to get on there and, and run for half an hour, tell him, forget it. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, aspirin, I do, do do aspirin on some patients. Vitamins. Vitamin K2 is extremely important for Indians because since we changed our diet, we don't get enough vitamin K2. All of you must be taking vitamin K2, not K1, K2. You have to be on K2. You have to be on K2. If you don't take vitamin K2, you're going to get calcification of your arteries. I have all the studies. There's a whole lecture that I give just on vitamin K2. Omega-3 you have to take because there's not enough omega-3 in our foods. Vitamin D3 you have to take because there's not enough vitamin D3 in your diet. And I love this herb called berberine. It's fantastic, for mostly for Indians, because it, it improves your sugar and your insulin levels. And then I do give metformin, and I also use angiotensin receptor blockers. So these are medicines that I actually use when I have to. And I, there are other diabetes drugs that I also use because they're very important. But the mechanism is important. I don't want to increase insulin levels. I want to give medicines that actually decrease insulin levels. Um, and then, you know, there's these medicines, the SGLT2 inhibitor. But, you know, you don't need to know about all this. This is what the doctors are supposed to know. They reduce cardiovascular risk by 38%, hospitalization by 35%, death by 30%. How do these drugs work? They actually make you pee out the sugar in your body, excessive sugar. So in summary, this is the last few slides. Lose weight. Avoid all sugar and high fructose cones. Now, I didn't say anything about fruit. That's the other lie. You know what happened in the 70s? They took fruit and vegetables together, lumped it. Oh, you must have lots of fruits and vegetables. Fruits are overrated. It's just nature's candy. It's full of fructose. It's got nothing else in it. Hardly anything in fruit except sugar. You want fruit? Have it once or twice a week. But not this, I have fruit for breakfast. In the evening after I finish eating, I watch my TV and I sit with a whole bowl of fruit. That's nonsense. Fruit is supposed to be seasonal and supposed to come in the fall so that you can get through winter. So animals have fruits and berries so that the fructose levels go high, they go become insulin resistant, they put on a lot of fat, then they go into hibernation in winter. For us, winter never comes. <laughs> Why are you taking fructose when there's no winter for you? Just think about this logically, you would say, my God, the insanity. The insanity is just going crazy. Avoid vegetable seed oils. Time-restricted feeding, avoid antibiotics. Look, if you've got a cold, if your poor kid's got a cold, leave him alone. <laughs> Why are you giving him an antibiotic? For what? Do you know my kids, I give them maybe once or twice antibiotics. My wife used to get mad at me. Oh, my but you, you know. I said, leave him alone. <laughs> I said, leave the kid alone. It's a virus. It's a virus, leave him alone. But no, I have to do it. So only twice. And thank goodness they were all very healthy and, and, and uh, doing exceedingly well. And, and I just, just mean physically, mentally as well, because it's, it's all linked together. It's all linked together. But I mean, if you're going to give this garbage diet and expect your kid in school to be br bushy tailed and, and awake and alert all the time, nonsense, because he takes that sugar, then he causes the dip, then he falls asleep in class, then he gets out again, takes another sugar high, and he's like this, and it's uncontrollable. The teacher's saying, sit down, Tommy. But you know, what is this? <laughs> you're responsible for his bad behavior in class. You're the cause of it. Never mind. Okay, <laughs> consume organic meat. Seven hours of sleep. That's very important. If you don't sleep enough, your hormones are going to be mucked up. I don't care what happens to you. You have to have seven hours of sleep every day. Look, as busy as I am, I get seven hours of sleep every night. I make sure I go for seven hours of sleep. And resistance exercises, stress management. Now, this is important. So if you look at Indians, we've come abroad. And even in India, it's a new economy in that. This competitiveness, this looking at, you know, um, my boss makes this much and that guy's cars like this. The comparison that we do is very hurtful to our physiology. So I'm just going to leave you with a couple of studies that, are, that really come to mind. The Whitehall study looked at people in Whitehall who all had the same health care availability. But those who had the lowest ranks had the highest coronary artery disease, those at the highest ranks did not. That means control at work, how much autonomy you get, very important. So it's again, this is your idea of who you are metabolizes into your physiology. Your idea of who you are, who you think you are, 
What am I? Oh yeah, I'm, I am an educated person. I am a good person. I have a lot of friends. You know, your self-esteem, your relationships with people, your purpose in life, your purpose at work, and how much, how much control you have in your life metabolizes itself into your physiology. So these studies have been done over and over again. So have good friends. Have a good friend circle. Understand what life is and, and don't get caught up in only these goals that sometimes are unattainable and materialistic. You, there has to be a stress management, a meaning, spirituality in your life, and do pleasurable activities. Find something that makes, makes it fun in your life that you really like to do. Find it. Find it and do it. Huh? And uh, don't drink more than one drink a day. <laughs> one alcohol actually makes you live longer. Second one nullifies the effects of the first one. Third one hurts you. Uh, <laughs> so, so there you go. And then 10 minutes of direct sunshine every day. Because you're supposed to have sunshine, but instead we wear these clothes. We come indoor all the time, and we're afraid of the sun. And of course, these people, you know, skin lotion, look at all the sunscreen and everything. It's all nonsense. Go out and get some sunshine, 10 minutes every day, direct sunshine. Stay in it. Yeah, take your top off. <laughs> um, okay, behavioral therapy. Your enablers, there are some friends that love you, but they're going to kill you. So watch out for them, okay, and avoid the addictive foods. That's it, guys. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks. What we commonly told is a total lie. The only time you're supposed to eat every two, three hours is if you're expecting a baby. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> so I always say pregnant women shouldn't be doing this. Of course, they should be eating for their baby. But even then, they need to be eating whole foods and right foods. And, and if you look at the Indian culture, you know, Throughout the pregnancy, in different stages of the pregnancy, the grandmothers usually tell them to eat certain types of foods. And there's a lot of intelligence behind it. And you follow some of that intelligence, you'll do very well. But for the rest of us who are not growing like that, no, it's a total lie. It's been made up. It's an old wives tale that you're going to eat lots of small little meals. That was debunked in the 70s, but it's still, you know, all these things are very hard to erase now. But they've been stuck in our psyche for a very long time, but no. You are made to feast and fast, feast and fast. Our physiology is made for that. And the, I didn't even talk about ketones and ketogenesis today and when you start making ketones. That's a whole different talk. But basically, you're a hybrid machine. You're supposed to be working on gasoline and then diesel, gasoline, then diesel. In this case, you're supposed to be working on glucose and ketones, glucose and ketones. But if you're just on glucose, glucose all the time, then the insulin is just going to make you store, 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 and the storage never gets used. So you have a nice fat deposit account which never gets used. And that fat deposit is inflammatory. It, there needs to be a turnover of it all the time. So you're supposed to feast and fast. Feast. That's the machinery you were made for. But we changed it, and we only use one kind all the time. So next time, go buy a hybrid car and only use gas all the time. You can't do that. That's not the way it's supposed to be used. Olive oil. So olive is a fruit, so any fruit oil is OK. Now, even then, you think that olive oil is all monounsaturated fats? It's not. It's only 50 to 60% monounsaturated fats, and then 30 to 35% is actually saturated, and then 10% is polyunsaturated. So monounsaturated fats are okay. They're neutral. They're not good for you. Watch what I'm saying. It's not that it's good for you. Others, you go out and start using olive oil for, uh, in buckets and buckets, and some people actually do that. Oh, I consume no. It's got saturated fat. It's got monounsaturated, which is neutral, so you can use it for the salads. Don't heat it because it'll break down and cause trans fats. So olive oil is okay. Use it in your salad with balsamic vinegar. But don't heat it because it'll break down. Ghee has the highest breaking point of all fats. That's why we use ghee because you can heat it up to 400 degrees. It will not break down. But if you take any other oil, it'll break down at 200 degrees. It's already breaking down into bad fats. So what about sourcing like mustard oil? Mustard oil? Mustard oil is okay 
in small amounts. It is medicinal, but it also is it's, it's, it's cancerous. So if you eat too much of that, it can cause cancer too. So for occasions, for sp certain types of foods, you can use it. Sesame oil, on the other hand, is okay. So sesame oil is much better. So in the order, it's ghee, and then sesame oil, and then mustard oil in our foods. Then I can buy olive oil so you can fry and you can heat. So yeah, it's not a good idea. And if you look at the Mediterranean diet, they never fried in, in, in that oil. They never did. And the Mediterranean diet, they say, is very good. Well, you know, Mediterranean diet has mostly vegetables only, and they used to eat meat only once a week. But they, they did have olive oil because that's all they had in those days. But they didn't fry in it because they didn't eat much fried food. So olive oil should not be fried. I tell everyone just to use ghee. Ghee for frying? Yeah. Yeah, it's the best thing to use. Yeah. Now, you can occasionally fry in sunflower oil or whatever oil you want, but then you've got to do it occasionally only. Like, let's say once in a while you want to make some potato chips, okay? Okay, I don't mind that. But you can do that once every three weeks, let's say. And then that oil, get rid of it. So you can occasionally fry, but use, use, don't reuse that oil. Don't reuse that oil, but you can use it. Yeah, you can. Yes, ma'am. In Hindi, I don't have it in Hindi. <laughs> <laughs> I can't that is, explain that is extra it. charge. <laughs> <laughs> can come down yeah. right. Well, I can ask Tim if he will take it and then have somebody put subtitles in Hindi at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. yeah that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It's a very nutty business. So <laughs> it's it's crazy. So. Peanuts, peanuts are a legume. They're not a nut. Did you know that? They, they belong to the pea family. So they are legumes and they contain a lot of lectins in them. So that's one. Cashews, cashews are also a legume. So they have a lot of lectins in it. So if you want to eat nuts, you've got to eat the real nuts, which are walnuts, pecans, almonds, um, hazelnuts, uh, pistachios. Those are the real nuts. Uh, macadamia, Brazilian nuts, those are very good for you. And you should probably eat a, a fistful, which is what I do every day. I eat a fistful of those. More. And without that, not, not the ones that come in the tin that have been, you know, what I told you earlier on. Just buy the raw ones. And okay, so smoothies. So I get asked this all the time about smoothies. You know, generally speaking, I was doing smoothies years and years ago, but now I don't do it. Because just think about it. There was no electricity or smoothie machines. Back in the day. That's true. We had teeth. <laughs> we had teeth. And one reason why we have bad teeth today is because we don't use the teeth the way we should use teeth. That's why our kids are all growing up, and each and every kid needs to go to the orthodontist because the teeth never get stressed, so they never grow in the right shape and size, and the, the arch of the palate doesn't grow properly, and then these poor kids have small jaws, and they don't have the right size jaw, and they have small little jaws, and therefore they get crowding and all these things. It's, so you're right. You, it's supposed, you're supposed to use your teeth, and we don't even let our poor kids use teeth. <laughs> and we give them straws, yeah. so then the top of the arch goes crazy. Oh, yeah, just give him a, something real to eat and drink. Yeah, very great, good question. M milk has two problems. W one is some people can't tolerate it, okay? Uh, but the other problem is that it's got gluteo, um, it has caseomorphin in it. So caseomorphin makes you addicted to milk. So if you drink a lot of milk every day, you you'll crave for it. So you do become addicted to it. The third thing is that there are studies to show that dairy products actually reduce the incidence of heart disease. But then the biggest problem with it is that the protein that's in milk is not very easily absorbed. The casein in it is, is not easy to absorb. And most adults don't need milk because we are the only species that still drinks milk of another mammal. Right. That's true. Doesn't make sense. So I say you want the protein, you want the milk products, 
you can get that from other things. So I said, don't drink milk. You can add milk to your tea, to your coffee, uh, but I, I don't drink milk, and I don't advise people to drink milk. Yeah. And then plus cows, their uh, DNA is 50% spider. Yes. Now the problem, also t today's milk has a lot of um, hormones in it, a lot of hormones and antibiotics in today's milk. So uh, that's why I don't, I don't advise milk. Way too many hormones in it. Yes, yes ma'am. Yeah, well, there's very few healthy vegans I've seen in my office. Being a vegan is very hard, and a lot of them have too much carbs. So they'll go and buy all these packaged foods and boxed foods and everything else, but it's all vegan, and they think they're very, very healthy, but it's all processed and, and a lot of carbs, and they all have diabetes, and it's just a, no. Vegan is very hard to do. It's a full-time job. So I tell people, look, you gotta live your life as well. You don't have to be a vegan. There's nothing wrong with eating the right kinds of meats. A little bit of chicken, organic chicken, a little bit of red meat that is grass finished, some organic eggs, uh, fish, which should be wild caught fish like salmon. There's nothing wrong with that. But of course, you don't wanna go crazy with it. So you're supposed to have a balanced diet. It means you eat fish maybe once a week. You might eat red meat once every 10 days. You might eat a little bit of chicken. But to go extreme is not a good idea. I wanna just leave you with one thought, okay? The Okinawans live to 100. They eat mostly starch. Then you have the Eskimos who never eat starch. They only eat meat. They eat, uh, um, they eat fish all the time. And once in a while, they'll go and eat some seaweed, right? They live to 100. Then the Maasai tribes in East Africa, I'm familiar with them because I'm an African. They drink blood and they drink milk. And once in a while, that cow dies, and they'll eat the cow. And they live to 100. <laughs> What's wrong with all these people? How come? The one thing they all have in common is not this diet, that diet, meat, no meat. One thing they all have in common, all eat non-processed food. Yep. Natural, yeah, natural. Natural food. That's what they eat. So whether it's high carb, low carb, so people say paleo diet. Well, paleo diet, if you do a pure paleo diet, you'll live long. But provided that it's the right stuff, you know, that it's not this, it's, it's going to be proper. So I don't, I don't say don't go crazy because all these crazy diet, that's why the diets don't work. So people come to me and say, oh, I want this outline of what lunch, breakfast, dinner. I said, I don't know. You know, you're an Italian, so I don't know what foods you like. But, <laughs> but whatever you eat, whatever you eat, just make sure it's whole, non-processed. And whole, that's it. Now, you know, you are Gujarati, uh, you may be Punjabi. I don't know what kind of, as long as it's whole, as long as it's natural, unadulterated, you're gonna do fine. That's my point. Great, 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 great. You see, the nice thing about fermented foods, nature has already done half the digestion for us. So that's why you gotta do it. So there's a couple of things I wanna tell you about that. Fermented foods, nature's already half digested it. So all the bad stuff that's in milk, for example, it's already good. That's why you can have dahi, you can have yogurt, and you can have kefir, and all those are fine. Even people, but when they drink milk, they feel terrible. So that's number one, right? The second thing is that when you soak something in water, and then the water goes into the food, like beans or lentils or whatever, and then you heat it in a pressure cooker, it kills all the lentils. So 10 minutes of pressure cooking of food, hmm, after you've soaked it overnight first, it kills the lentils in it. So the old way of cooking is the way to really go. We must kill the lentils, soak them overnight first, beans or whatever. So the same idea, that nature will take care of a lot of things for you. But fermented foods are wonderful. So vitamin K2, which I think all of you should be on, is 200 micrograms a day. 200 micrograms. So that's vitamin K2. Vitamin D is 5,000 units a day. So, so, what's, your take? Sorry, go so ahead. what's your take on multivitamin? Kind of In general, 
I don't because you know you don't know what's missing in your body. So if you really want to know, then you do a blood test. It's called SpectraCell, which measures all the minerals, amino acids, and antioxidants, and everything in your body. Then take only what is missing. Because I think that if you overdo it and you start taking all this vitamin, your body has to deal with it. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it has to deal with all that unnecessary stuff in there. It's just it's not normal. It's not natural. There's no multivitamin in nature that I can go up and pick up. See, I'm trying to be more natural. When you just go with the themes of nature and be seasonal, eat the seasonal foods um, and eat foods in their whole state, you'll get everything. Your liver can store everything. Your liver can store all the vitamins for six months. That's why the liver is the most healthy food. <laughs>
the new cells start coming up. And with it, the stem cells also come in because senescent cells have died. The stem cells, which are pluripotent, they go and replace the cells that need replacing. And one of the cells they replace, and this should, I want you to all leave with this, one of the cells they replace, whether you like to believe this or not, is your brain. So you think that your brain cells, once they're dead, they're dead, they're dead, you collapse, you're done. No, the studies are not show, now showing that when you fast, you not only preserve your brain cells, but you can actually grow new cells. Wow. Yeah. And there's a substance called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. And BDNF actually increases also on day number three. So you see the theme here, three days, it seems to be the magic number. If you want to get really high level benefit from fasting, it's the three-day water fast. Three-day water fast every six to seven weeks, you do a three-day water fast. That is the ultimate. I mean, that just gets you the best benefit. If you don't want to get premature dementia, you don't want to get cancer. If you have connective tissue disease, if you have diabetes, three-day water fast. But during those three days, your caveat is you cannot take your diabetes medicine during those three days, otherwise your sugar may drop because you're not taking calories, right? And you mustn't take your blood pressure medications because your, your blood pressure may drop. And just drink lots of water. So during the three days, it's just water, 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 water only. That's it. And if you have a physician who is agreeable or understanding, you need to tell them that you're doing a three-day water fast. Because if you start getting cramps on the second day, oh, cramps. That's because you're losing salt and magnesium. So then you take a glass of water, put a pinch of salt in it, and you drink it, your cramps go away. If you're going through withdrawal, he should be able to see that, oh my God, the sugars are fine, but this guy is breaking out and so he's truly a junkie. Slow down. Now you need to, you can't be eating five meals a day and then go do a three-day water fast. You need to condition your body to get into a three-day water fast. So you first start skipping random meals, one day lunch, one day dinner, one day, then go to two meals a day. You do that for three, four weeks. Then go to one meal a day, five days a week. Five days a week, one meal. Then two, three meals on the weekends. You do that for a couple of weeks. Then you say, now my body is ready to do a three-day water fast. You can have black coffee, black tea, and water. Black coffee, black tea. You can have. And then hunger. Oh my God, doc, I was really, really hungry. What do you do? Well, no problem. Take your chai, put your masala in it, because that doesn't break your fast. And then you put half a teaspoon of ghee in it. And now you drink that, your hunger's gone. No sugar, no rise in your insulin. So these are little tricks that a physician can teach you, but somebody who's into this. <laughs>